Hello. Tell you what, let's start the session with a pirate song. Okay, you may know the song. If you do, feel free to join in. If you don't, you'll soon get the hang of the chorus and you can join in with that. Here's the song. When I was one, I took my gun the day I went to sea. I jumped aboard the pirate ship and the captain said to me, we're sailing larboard and starboard, forward and up over the Irish Sea. A bottle of rum to fill my tum and that's the life for me. Oh, ah. That's the bit there. A bottle of rum to fill my tum and that's the life for me. Oh, ah. That's it. When I was two, I lost my shoe the day I went to sea. I jumped aboard the pirate ship and the captain said to me, We're sailing larboard and starboard, forward and aft, over the Irish Sea. A bottle of rum to fill my tum and that's the life for me. Oh, ar. When I was three, <laughs> I hurt my knee the day I went to sea. I limped aboard the pirate ship and the captain said to me, we're sailing larboard and starboard, forward and aft, over the Irish Sea. A bottle of rum to fill my tum, and that's the life for me. Oh, ar. When I was four, I slammed the door. The day I went to sea, I jumped aboard this pirate ship, and the captain said to me, We're sailing larboard and starboard, forward and aft, over the Irish Sea. A bottle of rum to fill my tum, and that's the life for me. Oh, ar. Last verse. When I was five, I learned to dive. The day I went to sea, I jumped aboard the pirate ship, and the captain said to me, We're sailing larboard and starboard, forward and aft, over the Irish Sea. A bottle of rum to fill my tum, and that's the life for me. Oh, ar. Should we just do that chorus again? A bottle of rum to fill my tum, and that's the life for me. Oh, ar. Brilliant. Well done, guys. Now, i got a story for you. If you're ready for it. It's called The Ship's Dragon. Now, a lot of pirate ships, they just got a ship's cat. It's not a bad idea, is it, a cat? You know, you can catch the rats and the mice and that, try to keep the vermin down. On the Zanzibar, we got a ship's dragon. That's right, a dragon. The Lady Dorothea Shadowclaw. To friends, she's called Dot or Dotty. To me, Dotty, because we're friends. And a dragon's a really good idea on a ship because Dorothea, she can get bigger smaller when she's small she can catch all the rats and the mice and all that and she can sleep in a little oven tray in the captain's cabin so he's got like central heating at night you know rank has its privileges he gets to keep nice and warm but the other big benefit of a dragon instead of a cat is she can get bigger we've had time when Lady Dorothea Shadowclaw has flown on the far side of ships that we're after boarding and distracted them. She's made a lot of noise and she's flapped her great wings. And they're all turning to see her and getting word that she might attack them. And we can sneak up on the other side, lash on and board her and capture the prize ship without having much of a fight at all. It's an excellent idea, an excellent idea. And the other thing is when she's small, we can feed her easy, feed her scraps. And she's best friends with our cook, the gingerbread man. You might remember the story about how he became our cook. If you don't, it's in last year's Moles Ballet's art story type stuff where I was telling the story then, you know? And he rode up. And when she's big, she can catch great huge fish, you know, like tuna and all sorts, big ones. And she can feed herself that way. 
but also she can catch extra for us. And sometimes if we're on shore, she can go and catch us nice fresh meat, or obviously wild meat. She wouldn't take someone's prize breeding stock of bulls or, or um, you know, pigs, nor nothing. Anyway, I'm going to tell you about an adventure we had with her one day. Well, one day over several days. What the thing is, me and the captain, we got a special whistle to call her. If you heard that, there's every chance you could be a dragon person. But we'd to call her when we needed her. And she was out this day fishing. Mm. And she just spotted a great, huge barracuda. And she was diving in to get it you know like a sea eagle or an osprey or something well a dragon's a bit like that and they catch the fish in their claws but just as she was diving in the captain he blew in his whistle because he wanted to go her to come back so he could ask her something and she hit the water at the wrong angle she breathed in all the sea water it put her internal fires out she couldn't do flame nor nothing and you probably know it's the it's the fires that make dragons light enough to fly. So poor old lady Dorothy, as she was stuck out there on the water, no fish. And she had to try to get back to the ship without flying. So she was using her great wings to sort of scull along. And we saw her from the ship and we took a rowboat out and rowed out to her. And got her to come back up, up, get small and come onto the boat and brought her back. And then we were trying to sort things out for her. A friend, a cook, he used uh, the matches to try and light her breath and get her fires going. Didn't work. He made her a red hot curry, like Scotch bonnet chilies and everything, because he thought that might do the trick. And she loved it, but it didn't set the fires going. It didn't work. Then she remembered an island we'd passed that had a volcano. So we tacked about, we sailed the ship back to that island, beached. Beached uh, the ship in the bay and rode across. And we got along to the foot of the volcano with uh, Dorothea just small being carried. And we looked up the volcano and it was steep. Of course, if she'd been able to fly, she could have just flown straight up, couldn't she? But she couldn't fly. <laughs> That's why we had to go there. And we just couldn't get her up the volcano. So that didn't work out. And we were sailing back and we were desperately trying to think of something. And the captain said, we've got to do something, Peg. What can we do? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm thinking it out. I'm trying to think it through, but I can't think what we could do. And I was thinking, and I was thinking. And when we got back to the ship, the gingerbread man said, I've had an idea. He said, the hardest thing I can think of is when you fire a cannon and the cannon's hot we've got to throw water over it to cool it down <laughs> what if we loaded a cannon with powder but no ball and fired it with the lady dorothea in front of it do you think that might work and the captain said i doubt it but it might we'll have a go he said mr peg i said yes captain he said i'm relying on you you're our master gunner so it's up to you said, yes captain so Lady Dorothea, she went and she got to medium size, floating on the water just outside one of the cannon ports. And I loaded the cannon, I rammed it in, and I just put nice wadge of cannon powder, you know, the old gunpowder, black powder we use. And I, I primed the feed. And I shouted out, you ready, Lady Dorothea? And I could see she was. And then I said, okay, I'm doing it now. And I, I tied the ropes to the side of the ship so the cannon wouldn't come back and bash me. And I put the slow match to the powder. And there was a and then <laughs> the cannon fired right into Dorothea's open mouth and old Dotty, she got blown back a hundred yards <laughs> through the water. But then she looked at me and she went, <sighs> and flame came out glorious flame we'd relit her fires hadn't we it worked and she took off and she spiraled up into the air and she flew around and she flew up 
Oh, it was such a relief, I tell you. We had a working ship's dragon back again. And that was how poor old Lady Dorothea Shadow Claw lost her flame and got it back. I think it's a good story, you know. And the thing is, you know it's true, because I was there. I fired the cannon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, here's some uh, daft pirate jokes for you. Why do pirates struggle so much learning the alphabet? Well, it's because we spend so long stuck at sea. But once we have learned it, what's our favourite letter? R. What do you call a really stupid pirate? The pillage idiot. Why couldn't the pirates play cards? Because the captain was standing on the deck. Now pirates don't eat many vegetables at all. In fact, they're a scurvy lot. But you know what their least favourite vegetable is of all? Leeks. You really don't want leeks. <laughs> Well, there was a few jokes, eh? What do you think? Was that enough for you? I reckon it probably was, wasn't it? What do you say? Right, well, I'm going to be telling you a few little stories about a pirate that I'm ashamed was once a member of the Zanzibar crew. It's Bad Billy Bombast, and he was a bad one. He was one of the worst. When he was on the Zanzibar, he wouldn't work. He, he was good at fighting. That was about all he was good for. And he was found to be stealing the captain's rum. And he was told he was going to be marooned. He'd be dumping at the next island we came to. And he went mad, didn't he? He broke into the captain's cabin. He was smashing everything. He smashed the lamps. He tore up charts. He was, oh, he was... Well, he got thrown in the brig, didn't he? Now, the next island we came to, he was very lucky, actually, because the next island we came to, it had a freshwater spring, and it had animals and fruit and stuff, so he was going to be all right, and we dumped him there. And if I'm honest, he was no great loss. Any road, he got very, very lucky there, because a couple of weeks later, Captain Wickham was sailing by in his ship, Wickham's Revenge. And they picked old uh, Bombast up and they took him on board the ship. And uh, he, I guess he gave them some sort of cock and bull story about he'd been shipwrecked or something. But that's how come he was there when the Wickham's Revenge raided the great cathedral in Mexico City. They were part of a group of pirate ships that worked together and made this big old raid and they stole a whole load of Spanish treasure. The loot was apparently unbelievable. And Wickham had organised it, so he had the pick of the treasure. And they had the, the best thing they had, one particular thing, was an emerald the size of a cackle fruit, the you know, size of a hen's egg. And that was called Ojo de Santiago, St. James's Eye. <laughs> Word was, it was magical. But I, I don't know about that. But you'll find out in the story. Because what happened after that was they caught on to what Bombas was like. And they dumped him off the crew. They didn't want him either once they knew what he was like. And that was where he was lucky again. Because shortly after that, the Wickham's Revenge was in a fight with three Admiralty ships and got sunk. No survivors. And old Bombast was left with the only man alive who knew where Wickham had hidden the treasure. All the loot from the cathedral, he'd hidden it in a cave on an island. And Bombast was the only man who knew. Well, he managed to scrape together a crew of his own and a, a, a 
pretty rubbishy old ship that they managed to uh, acquire somehow. I don't think he bought it. And he called it the Sea Slug, which, I mean, isn't that a rubbish name for a ship? You know, not the, the Fighting Bombard or something, the Sea Slug. Well, any road up with the Sea Slug, he sailed around the coasts and the islands and they got to the island where the treasure was buried. Now, old Bombast, he hadn't told any of his new crew about the treasure because he wanted it for himself. And he waited till one night. The ship was quiet. And as far as he knew, the whole crew were asleep. And then he got the little boat, not the long boat, but the little rowboat. And he rowed himself to the shore. And he pulled up the boat onto the beach. And he set off through the path through the jungle you know along the paths and heading for the cave but what he didn't know was a couple of the crew members who'd kind of caught on of what he was like had followed him in the other rowboat so they followed him down the path and they followed him through a ravine and then he came to this crack in the ravine that was the cave mouth and he went in and he was looking at all the treasure and he was thinking I can't take all of this, it'll be obvious. I've just got to take a couple of little bits, a couple of the best things. So he grabbed the Eye of San Diego and pushed that in a pocket. And he grabbed gold and pushed that in a pocket. And he had a couple of little sacks of gold that he was just going to carry like that. And he came marching out of the cave. And as he came out, they hit him over the head, didn't they? <laughs> and they tied him up. And they went in to look at the cave and see what else there was. And old Bombast, he woke up gradually, you know, sort of come to, oh. And he found, even though he was tied up, he could just get one hand to the pocket. And they'd left the Eye of St. James in his pocket, the Ojo de Santiago. And so he held it in his hand and he said, blast those two that have tied me up. And there was a flash of light from the cave. And eventually he managed to wriggle out of the ropes because they'd intended to come back and sort them out so they weren't that well tied. And he put the old Eye of St. James back in his pocket. He went into the cave and where the two pirates would have been, there were two little piles of ash. It had worked its magic. So meanwhile, he, he, he took his stuff back again and he put it in his pockets and he put stuff to carry. He headed back to the shore and he got in the little boat. And he rode back to the ship, put the boat safe, went back to his cabin. And then in the morning, he was one of the ones leading the hue and cry. Where are these two sailors gone? They've only done a runner. They've gone and deserted. And they sailed away and they sailed back to England. And Bombast, he'd been so lucky because he had all this stuff and he hadn't had to share it. And he sold it for a good deal of money. And he thought he was going to buy some land, and settle down and be an English gentleman. Maybe get, you know, he wouldn't have a proper job, but he might become a member of parliament or something, you know. And it did come to a sticky end. But I'll tell you about that in another story. All right. Right then, I keep saying right then, don't I? Here's another song. It's a much shorter one. Hi, fiddly dee, a pirate's like for me. You sail across the Spanish main, with scarlet coat and a golden chain. Hi, fiddly dee, a pirate's like for me. Well, I'll tell you what, I just remembered another story where Bad Billy Bombas was bested by barons. That's as children. It was his three children. Eden, Ezra and Eliza. And they was out having a little row in the um, West Wittering Bay. When they dropped their oars. They lost their oars and they was drifting. And they had the misfortune to meet up with the Esperanza, Bad Billy's ship. And Bad Billy got his men to scoop them up and bring them to him. 
and he thought he'd have a bit of a game with them, didn't he? He said, look, I got a choices for you. Now look, I'm going to give you each in turn one gold coin. And with that gold coin, you've got to try and find something to fill my ship from hull to top deck. And the children didn't really know what he was talking about, but they had to go along with it because he'd got hold of them, you know. He said, if you lose, I'll slap you in the brig. If any one of you wins, I'll let all three of you go. Can't say fairer than that, can I? Of course, it wasn't fair because he was never going to let them win, but any road. So Eden was the oldest, and so he gave her a gold coin. And she thought and thought and thought, and she went to the market. And she bought thousands and thousands and thousands of feathers. She thought, I'll fill the ship with feathers. And she started from the bottom most hold and she filled the ship with feathers and she filled everywhere, the cabins, the holds, the different decks. And in the end, the ship was full of feathers. And she said to Bad Belly, well, I, I, I've done that then. And he went and he said, I'll have a look. He started at the top and he looked in the captain's cabin. It was full to the top and he looked at all the decks. By the time he got down to the bottom deck, the all up, the feathers had settled a little bit and he looked along and there was this little gap along the top of the feathers. And he said, nope, you ain't done it. The ship's not full. And he banged her into the brig. He said to Ezra, the next child, their brother, said, right, tomorrow, I'll give you a gold coin and you see what you can do. So Ezra had all night to think about it. And the next day, once he got the gold coin and was rowed across the shore, he went to the market and he bought all the candles he could find. He bought hundreds of candles. Came back to the ship and he put them everywhere in the ship and he lit them. And so the, all the bottom deck, the middle deck, all the decks were lit up. All the cabins were lit up. And he said, there you go, I filled the ship with light. And Billy Bones looked, and everywhere he looked, there was light. But he was determined. And in his cabin, there was a big old chest. And he opened up the lid of the chest, and he climbed in, and he closed the lid. And he called out from inside the chest, no, it's pitch dark in here. There's no light in here. You hadn't filled the ship with light. And he came out, and he said, right, you're in the brig. And he said to young Eliza, right, you're their last chance. Tomorrow I'm going to give you a gold coin and you have to see what you can do to fill my ship. You've got to find something to fill it with. So Eliza had all night to think about what she would do. She didn't really know. So when she got rowed to shore and went to the market, she still didn't really know. Then she saw the thing she thought was just right. And she bought it and she came back to the ship. He said, right, good one then. And she took it out and it was a tin whistle and she started blowing it and everywhere he went he could hear the tin whistle he was getting angry he thinking, she's done it she's blowing done it she's filled my ship with music and then he remembered his chest and he thought i can get in there and if i can't hear it i've won if i can hear it i can pretend i can't and i still won so he took her up to his cabin and he got in the chest and he pulled down the lid and he shouted, I can't hear no music. So she quickly stopped blowing the whistle and put the lock on the chest. She locked him up and then she went and she used his keys and she opened up the brig and she got Eden and Eliza and oh, sorry, she got Eden and Ezra and the three of them went down to their boat, dropped it into the water, and borrowed some oars from this pirate ship and they rowed back to shore as quick as you like and they left the, the oars there with a note saying these are for bad Billy and uh, so they got him back and that was how he got defeated by the three kids and I think it really served him right because he's a dirty cheat so there you go what do you reckon do you think it served him right I think it did Here's a little anecdote for you before the next story before I found the gingerbread man to come and be our cook, the captain was trying to find a cook by interviewing people. He had one man turn up, called himself Lucky. Thing is, he had a patch, he had a look, he had a, 
a peg leg, one leg. The captain said, well, why do you call yourself lucky? He said, well, I have a lot of luck. Not all good. The captain said, well, what happened to your leg? Well, you see, I had bad luck. I fell off the ship and a shark grabbed hold of my leg. He said, but I had good luck because my mates pulled me back and all it got was the bottom bit. And another bit of good luck was we had a surgeon who knew what he was doing on board and he was able to shoot you to things and everything. So uh, that was all I lost. And I, we had a carpenter on board, good carpenter, he made me this nice peg leg. And that was good luck as well as bad luck. And he said, well, what, what about your, your hook? He said, ah, I had the bad luck of somehow putting my hand in front of the cannon as we fired it. So it blew off my hand. Well, I had the good luck that the cannonball was burning hot and sealed all the arteries and everything in my wrist. So I only lost the hand. I had a further good luck that we had a man on board who could make me a hook. He said, well, okay, I can see that, but how did you lose your eye and have to have an eye patch? Well, I had the bad luck of having a seagull do a dollop on my cheek. And the captain said, well, how did that lose you your hand? Well, I had the bad luck, but it happened on the first day I had my hook. Oh dear. I'm not sure that was really a, a very nice story, was it? Not to worry. <laughs> well, I have a bit of a sad story for you now about bad Billy Bombast. Is a surprise, eh? Well, after he'd made all his money with the Eye of Santiago and then been bested by them three kids in his own cabin, Billy came on shore for a while. He thought he could just buy some land and become part of the gentry. He found he couldn't and he started drinking his fortune. He was getting drunk all the time. Really a bad way to go even for someone as bad as Billy. And what he was doing, he was just drinking himself into a stupor. And then one day, he more or less passed out on the grass beside a country lane. And as it happened, nearby there was a cottage where a lovely, lovely, lovely little girl lived with her grandma. Now, the little girl was the kindest and most polite little girl you'd ever want to meet. She didn't know grandma didn't have much money, but anything they had, they would share. And people were good to them but as a result, you know, like people would say, oh, I've got some spare apples. Would you like them? And she said, oh, yes, please. Thank you very much. That would make a nice pie for me and my grandma. Growing their own food, all they had was a few vegetables and a little na nanny goat that they used for milk. But they didn't have much land on which to feed the nanny goat. So what the little girl had started doing is taking the nanny goat down the lanes to let her eat the grass at the sides of the lanes. Now this one day, her nanny goat had the misfortune to come and disturb bad Billy Bombast, who had been passed out, drunk, more or less passed out, and he was lying there snoring. <laughs> And the goat came over and bumped into him. What's going on? And the little girl said, oh, I'm ever so sorry, sir. It's, it's my goat. She's hungry and she's she, she grass. I'm sorry that she's bumped into you. She shouldn't have done that. And he was so angry because he'd been woken up and he was drunk and he had a headache and he reached for his pistol and it wasn't there. He'd lost his pistol. He kicked out of the goat and he caught her hindquarters with his boot. Goat was scared, upset, she ran away, and the girl had to follow her running after. And the little goat knew no better, and it ran into the fairy wood. I know, no one goes there, do they? Because of the fairies, because the fairies will do rotten things to you if you're not careful. And the little girl saw her going into the wood, and she was really frightened. She said, oh, what can I do? My goat's gone into the wood. In the end, she got brave, and she went in after the goat. When she got into the woods, there was the goat, and everywhere there was a great carpet of the most delicious strawberries. And oh, the scent of those strawberries filled the air. 
No wonder the goat was eating its fill. And the girl walked across to the goat carefully and she grabbed it and she pulled it up. And she said to the empty woods, I'm ever so sorry that my goat has come and eaten your strawberries. She was scared by a bad man and ran in here not knowing. And she knew no better. I'm ever so sorry. Please forgive us. And the fairies like that because they do like politeness. And suddenly a bowl appeared in front of her and a voice from amongst the trees said, you're a lovely girl. Take yourself some strawberries. I should, would it be all right if I took some and I share them with my grandma? Is that all right? And they said, yes, of course, kindness. So she picked strawberries and she put them in the bowl. And she set off walking home with the goat and the bowl of strawberries. But, oh no, who did she meet on the way? Yeah, bad Billy. He said, what's that? What you got there? And she said, well, it's, it's a bowl of strawberries for, for, for me and my grandma. She said, well, I'm having some of them. And he reached into the bowl. He kept on doing it till it was just an empty bowl. And he said, God, they was delicious. Where'd you get them strawberries? And she said, well, I got them along the road in the woods. And he said, well, I'm for that. And he stormed off to go and get more strawberries. Meanwhile, she walked home with an empty bowl. And she told her grandmother all that happened and said, you know, this and this and this and this and, this and, then, and the strawberries and he ate them. And I said, oh no, if the strawberries, if he's eating them, oh, whoa, 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 whoa betide him. Because the fairies gave them to you. And if he goes in their woods and starts eating their strawberries without permission, They'll put a curse on it so that he'll never be able to stop eating them strawberries. And the little girl says, oh no, oh no, that's awful. I'd better run along and warn him. And the grandma said, yeah, you do that, that's kind. So she ran along to warn him and she was running down the lane. And just as she got to the woods, bad Billy ate his last strawberry and <laughs> his belly burst. And there was blood and guts and partly digested strawberries and new strawberries. It was a mess everywhere. Oh, the little girl was so upset. But do you know what I think? I think it kind of served him right. Don't you think? Because he was rude and he was greedy and he was not at all polite and he never said please or thank you. And I'm sorry, but even a pirate has standards, don't they? Oh dear. All these pirate stories seem to be turning a bit nasty, don't they? I tell you what, let's have a nice story that's got nothing to do with pirates. Right. I want to tell you the story of a very good boy. There was a boy in Punjab, his name was Atul, and he was such a good boy. And every year, for his birthday and for Christmas, he would say to his mum, Can I have a dog? Do you think I could have a dog? I'd love a dog. And his mum would say, we'll see. Which, you know, that's, that's grown up for not a hope, isn't it? But then one year, just before his birthday, he said, oh, mum, mum, can I have a dog? And because he'd been so good, and because she'd had a few good crops recently, so she had a little bit of money, she amazed them both by saying, yes, I will. I will get you a dog. Yes, you can have a dog. Wonderful. So I thought was really excited. But then the day before his birthday, there was a flash flood and the valley flooded from side to side. The valley they lived in, it was a huge flood, washed away lots of things, did a lot of destruction. One of the things that got washed away was Atul's little dog. The man had to come to his mum and say, I'm ever so sorry, I haven't got a dog for at all. It got washed away in the floods. He said, all I have got is I've got this one old drumstick. I know one drumstick's not much good for anything, is it? But I thought, you know, just to say to him, this is for now and there will be a dog later. What do you think? And I said, well, we can't do anything else really, can we? So she took the one drumstick and that all came down the next morning on his birthday. He said, oh, mum, mum, where's my dog? Where's my dog, mum? Oh, where, where, where's my dog, mum? 
his mum had to say, I haven't got a dog for you at all. There was a big problem, it washed away, blah, blah, blah. All I've got for you is a drumstick. That's all was a little bit upset, but then remember I told you he was a really good boy. And he said, that's all right, mum. That's all right. Oh, I love my drumstick. I'll teach it tricks. So stay. Play dead. Fall over. Fetch. And his mum was a bit upset. Obviously, she was going to be a bit upset, wasn't she? So she said, I'll tell you what, I told. Why don't you go outside and play? So he said, all right, I will. And he got a little bit of string and he tied it around the bit at the end of his drumstick. So I'll take my drumstick for a walk. <laughs> he didn't, he carried it really. But they went outside and he was jumping in puddles and it was a glorious morning after all the flooding, the rain had stopped and it was great. And he went off from the house and he went across the first bridge. And as he crossed the first bridge, he heard someone coughing and oh, suddenly he could smell this acrid black smoke. It was like, <laughs> he was coughing himself. And he walked a bit further on and there was the village baker in front of her oven and she couldn't get the fire to light. It was all black smoke billowing out. And he said, <laughs> what's wrong? And she said, I left my kindling out last night and it's got sopping wet. I can't get it to light. I'm not going to be able to do the baking. And that's all thought for a moment. And he said, I know what we could do. I've got my drumstick. It's all dry and varnished. If you chop that up, you could perhaps use it to start the fire with a bit of kindling to dry the kindling and then you get your wood on and it would, you'd do, be able to do your baking. And she said, oh, you are a good boy, I thought. I'll give that a go. And so she chopped up his drumstick. And before you knew it, she had a good fire going and she started baking. And I told her to stay just to make sure everything was all right. And it was. And he was about to go. She said, stop a minute, I told Come back, come back, come back. She said, here, have this. And she gave him a roti, like a flatbread and spread with butter. She gave it to him on a palm leaf and said, this is for you, I told, but remember, don't eat it straight away, it'll be too hot. And so he walked along, he was carrying his roti and he said to himself, well, what a funny old birthday. I wanted a dog, but I got a stick. Now, instead of a stick, I've got some bread. And he carried on and then he suddenly heard a baby crying. <coughs> we all know what's wrong. And he walked along and there was the village potter and he had his baby with him and the baby was crying and crying. And that's all said, oh, what's wrong? And the potter said, oh, I'm at my wits end. The, the baby won't stop crying. He's hungry and he should have had some bread, but the baker is not getting any baking done because of the flood. And that's all said, oh, I've got an idea. Look. I've got my roti, you can have that and feed the baby. So the baker took the roti and he fed the baby little by little. And the baby got quiet and the baby settled down and fell asleep. And the potter said, thank you so much, Adol. Here, have one of my big pots. And that's all wound up with this great, big, huge pot that he could barely carry. He was walking along, fortunately he still had a bit of string and he tied it around the far side to help him hold on. And he was walking along, walking along. And he got to the other bridge back across the river. And as he crossed the river, he heard a most awful commotion. Oh, bloody <laughs> and he gave up. And there was the village laundryman. He said, what's wrong? And the laundryman said, oh, I'm such an idiot. Oh, blah, 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 blah. I said, what, 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 what's happened? And the laundryman said, I left my big wash pot out last night and the floods came and it smashed it against the rocks. Well, I think you know what's going to happen next. I thought it was a really good boy. And he said, I've got this great big pot. Why don't you take it to do your washing? And he put it down. And the laundryman took it. He said, oh, you're a kind boy, Adolf. You're a really good boy. Tell you what, I've got this old coat here. Look, it's an old coat. You can have it. That's all right. And that's all. You know, no one ever came back for it, so that's all's getting it on. And he's had to roll the sleeves up and up and up and up and up and up because it's enormous on him. 
but he's still got his bit of string. He ties it around his waist to hold the, the coat up so it flows over instead of hanging on the floor. He says, well, thank you. That's really kind. And he walks away. And he thinks to himself, what a strange birthday. I wanted a dog, but I got a stick. For the stick, I got some bread. For the bread, I got a pot. And for the pot, I got this magnificent coat. And he carried on walking, and then he suddenly heard, ah, 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 shoo! And he came across, and there, there was a man standing just in his underwear, just in his underwear, and holding a little dog. And on the bush, he spread his clothes out to try to dry them. And I said, oh my goodness, what's wrong? And the guy goes, I'm, I'm, I'm frozen. And I said, why are you so cold? And the man said, I saw the little dog in the flood. It was trapped on one of the trees and I was afraid it was going to drown. So I jumped in and saved it. But now my clothes are all sopping wet. I'm, oh, I'm so cold. And I all said, do you know what? I can help you there. Look, I've got this coat. It's way too big for me. You have it. And the man took it and he put it on and he wrapped it around him. Oh, and he gradually got warmer and stopped shivering and stopped sneezing. I said, oh, thank you, little boy. Oh, that's better. Then the man said, can you do me one more favour? And Athol said, yeah, yeah, what do you want me to do? He said, well, I've got this little dog I rescued. I don't want a dog. Will you take it and look after it and give it a good home? And Athol said, oh, you bet I will. Oh, I've always wanted a dog. Yes, I will, I will. And so he took the little dog and he had still his string. He put it around its neck as a little walking along thing, but he carried it. He carried it anyway and he walked home with it. And he said, what a strange and wonderful birthday. I wanted a dog, but I got a stick. I swapped the stick for some bread. And then I swapped the bread for a great big pot. And I swapped the pot for a coat. And then I swapped the coat for my dog, my very own dog. I'll go and show mum and then I'll teach my dog some tricks. And that's what he did. What a good boy.